Let us bow and pray to give thanks for today's offering. Lord, thank you so much for the generosity that you have bestowed in your own blessings on us, Lord, and in your blessings on letting us participate in the growth and sustainability of your kingdom, Lord. We thank you so greatly for that, Lord, and we ask that you bless both the gift and the giver. Lord, and we also bring to mind so many other things we'd like to um, offer as well, Lord, and that is offer ourselves, Lord, in whatever's going on in this world, that you use us each and the gifting that we have, Lord, and also that you remind us constantly that the greatest offering we can give is the prayer that we make to you each and every day, Lord, to ask for the covering of God's people with your love and your guidance, Lord. In particular, we are right now in the midst of a very tumultuous nation, Lord, so we ask for special blessings and special prayers, Lord, over those that are finding themselves in such turmoil from a world that they did not help create. Lord, there are those that are uh, fighting for the rights, Lord, that they have felt uh, have been denied. Lord, we ask for your guidance, Lord, and your love on them. And also, Lord, on the uh, law enforcement and the fire department, Lord, and the EMS, anyone who worldwide has found that because they have represented your goodness, Lord, and your kindness, that, Lord, the good that are there who are um, fighting so hard, Lord, to be doing what is in your will, Lord, that you protect them and lift their spirits, Lord, and for any amongst us and those, Lord, that are in positions of power that need to know you and see you so they are also turning to the good and doing what is right amongst your people, Lord, we ask for your support and their growth, Lord, as well. But, Lord, we live in such um, unrest, and, Lord, we are asking that the peace um, that is known only in you is found in us as well. We ask this in Jesus' most precious holy name. Amen. As promised, today's um, sermon will not be as long as last weekend's. Uh, last weekend's it was undeniable that I needed to make sure that we got everything said that we needed to say. But today sort of runs along the same lines because, and I know I'm short, but this microphone is shorter. Let me get it up. Right. Um, that it is still, we are still in the midst of um, a lot of unrest and to not address that as much as we can is um, to not be, is to be negligent of the times that we are in. And so I hope that you find a message of comfort in today's words. The scripture we are beginning is from the book of Esther in chapter 4, beginning with verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And then we're going to skip down to where she is actually speaking to the king. And that is in chapter 7, beginning with verse 3. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today's sermon title is Badge of Honor. You will better understand the title as we go today, but for now, I want us to concentrate on two important aspects of today's scripture. The first one is that Esther, though the Jews were in danger, and she had not yet been identified as Jewish, she still proclaimed herself as Jewish, and she embraced it. And, secondly, she was able to find peace in facing whatever may come her way as a result of being identified as a child of the one and only God, as a member of his chosen people. Though Haman, as many of you recall, had marked her people for destruction, thus he had marked them as a people not even worthy of life. He had marked them as being below the value of all others in that nation. 
Esther Steele willingly took on that designation as a Jew in solidarity with the family of God. She, as a queen, the beloved wife of the king, wore that badge with honor. And by the grace of God, she was able to stand with the people of God, proclaim her allegiance to their plight, and overcome her own concerns for her own personal risk because God gave her the peace to do so. Well, for those that are not familiar with the story of Esther, Esther was brought to the palace of the king because of her beauty when he had sought a new queen. She had been raised by an uncle and had been dutiful to him and obedient to him. When she entered the castle, her uncle asked her not to reveal that she was Jewish, so it never came up. She never mentioned it. At one point, her uncle had uncovered a plot to kill the king. Esther relayed that information to her husband, the king. An investigation was held, and that information was found to be accurate. Esther's uncle Mordecai was credited in the books for having saved the king's life, but he had never been honored at that time for doing it. The king had a very powerful confidant and advisor in Haman. Because Mordecai bound only to worship I'm, yeah, be, sorry. Because Mordecai bound only to worship God would not show Haman the deference and worship that he desired. Haman hated him, not desiring though to single Mordecai out for death only, Haman spoke ill of the Jewish people as a whole and recommended to the king that they should all be killed. And the king permitted Haman to create and proclaim a royal decree. And as we read in Esther, and this was chapter 3 verse 12, then on the thirteenth day of the first month of the, the royal secretaries were summoned. They wrote out in the script of each province and in the language of each people all of Haman's orders to the king's satraps, the governors of the various provinces, and the nobles of the various peoples. These were written in the name of King Xerxes himself and sealed with his own ring. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as a law in every province and made known to people of every nationality so they would be ready for that day. Basically, it was the purge of all Jews. Well, Mordecai, of course, was devastated for the people of God. So he put on sackcloth and covered himself in ashes in his pain and in his distress. When word made it to Esther that her uncle was in such a state, she sent someone to him to find out what was going on, and she had not been informed at that time of the decree. Mordecai sent word back to Esther of the decree and asked her to go to the king on the behalf of her people to ask that they be spared. She sent word back to Mordecai that if she went to the king without being called by him, she would be risking her own death. And then we read in chapter 4, verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer, Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you will remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Well, Mordecai's love for the niece he had raised as a daughter was great. 
but his love for the people of God was greater, and his assurance that God will deliver his people gave him the peace he needed to take a risk with what he loved dearly. And that overwhelming love for the preservation of the people of God, of which she was a part, and the peace of God entered into Esther as well. And then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. And this is one of my favorite examples of God working behind the scenes in a way that no human can. And so many times when I'm looking for peace that God is working even when we don't really see it for our own eyes. This is a beautiful example of that. Because it tells us in Esther that that night the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles the record of his reign to be brought in and read to him. And it was found in the portion that was read to him that Mordecai had exposed Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who had conspired to assassinate the king. So God, in the middle of the night, without having to worry about doors or rules or laws, got the ball rolling in the very mind of the ruler of the nation. And yet, even as God was working behind the scenes, well, so was Satan. But even Satan knew that going against the people of God was not going to turn out well. Because we read of the advice that was given to Haman, and if you read the book of Esther, you'll see at one point the um, family was sort of egging him on. And then when the reality was he was going up against a Jew, they gave this advice. His advisors and his wife said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. So Satan had gotten started, but he, he honestly knew he would lose in the end. And as many of you recall, Esther had invited the king and the unwitting Haman to two banquets, the second of which she used to reveal herself as a Jew. And in response to the king's offer to grant her her desires, and this was before he realized or he knew she was Jewish, in chapter 7, beginning with verse 3, we read, Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. So if you are unfamiliar with the ending of Esther, please read the book, as they say. God in this book is never mentioned by name, but it is a phenomenal story of His intervention and the perseverance and the protection of his people. Well, if you read and think about it a lot, no matter the predicament of Esther, nothing that she had found herself in, she still identified herself as one of God's own. And she was given the peace that she needed to stand and do as God would have her to do. Well, a story that many of you could see um, on the internet, there are so many stories of survivors of the Holocaust. Every one of them to me is intriguing. This one in particular is about Magda Herzberger. She was a Jewish girl growing up in Romania in the late 1930s. Her prosperous family was Orthodox and had instilled in her, as she said, a great love in our Almighty God. She was 18 when Hitler's troops occupied Romania. It was at that time she and her family and all the Jews that were made to sew the yellow star of David on their clothing to mark them, mark them in her words as a dirty 
Jew. Shortly thereafter, her family was forced from their homes in the ghetto, I'm sorry, from their homes into homes in the ghetto. And from the ghetto, <clears throat> they were then forced into Auschwitz concentration camp. As the family stood there and awaited separation that they knew was coming, where the men would be separated from the women, her father took this opportunity to say these last words to Magda. He said, I want you to follow the path of love, forgiveness, and tolerance. Hang on to the three strongest pillars of life, faith, hope, and love. And never ever let hatred enter your heart because hatred is an evil force and ultimately it will destroy you. Because she was a healthy teenager, Magda was kept alive to be a worker in the concentration camp. And I'm going to spare our children the details of what her grisly work assignment was. But she did describe the mental stress of trying to reconcile the horrors of what she had found herself surrounded by. She said that in order to survive, she had to accept her reality and still cling to the positivity and hope and console herself with the thought that this nightmare could not last forever. Well, within seven weeks, now she was 18 when she was placed into the camp and considered healthy, but within seven weeks and two camp moves, that once healthy teenager body became weak from the cold, the labor, the starvation, and found herself right at death's door. Still forced to work in that condition, one day Magda's body gave up, and even with her strong mind, she collapsed among a number of bodies that had already passed away. Surrounded as she was at that moment by death, she said she was unable to move, she was unable to speak, and, but instead of focusing on the darkness that was closing in and threatened to envelop her, she still reached for the light and she prayed that God just take her soul on to heaven. Even in the midst of a complete destruction of her nation, of her home, of her family, and now even of her once healthy body, she clung to the one thing that could not be destroyed. And that was her identity as a child of God and to the peace that God had given her to endure anything the evil world was using to tear her apart. But she also prayed at that moment for a miracle. She vowed to God to keep alive the memory of what had happened to the people of God. And by a miracle, on that same day, the camp was liberated. And although the bodies that surrounded her were dead, a soldier still noticed that she was not dead. And he lifted her up and out of that camp. She was nursed back to health and was reunited with her mother, which is a second miracle if you know much about that time. Well, in the following years, she did not give in as I think so many of us would to hatred and um, thoughts of unfairness and bitterness and hatred. She followed her father's advice. So in the following years, she married and she immigrated to the United States. And with the life that God had preserved for her at her request, with the life that God rewarded her with, she became a marathon runner, a mountain climber, she was a skier, a lecturer, and has been the author of 14 books. She has been telling the message of what it means to keep your faith in the midst of adversity. <clears throat> she attributes her faith in God for her ability to forgive on that massive scale and her opportunity to keep alive this beautiful memory of who her people were and the God they serve. In the words of one of her poems, 
O Lord our God, please disperse the seeds of peace and brotherhood upon the earth as time rolls on the wheels of the universe. It's beautiful to think that after everything she'd gone through, that that's still what she's asking us to do as a nation, and that is disperse the seeds of peace and that the Lord take care of that on his level. Well, despite what situation Magda found herself in, as you can see, the key to her survival and her ability to thrive in the aftermath is because she continued to identify herself with the children of God. And God granted her the peace to endure. This theme of retaining and proclaiming oneself as belonging to God and relying on God for the peace to get through any crisis is taught again and again in the Word of God. In Exodus 10, we read of Moses, the once, um, sorry, once the son of a royal Egyptian family. He was verbally and loudly calling God, our God. In other words, identifying God as his God. He identified himself not as a pagan worshiper of the Egyptian gods, or the little g, but instead as one of the chosen people of the one and only true God. And God gave him the peace he needed to endure the long process of God extracting his people from the bondage they were under. And if you remember in uh, this verse, Moses said to uh, the Pharaoh, you must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshiping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. <clears throat> and when the Hebrews found themselves in bondage in Babylon, these three young men continued to identify as worshipers of the one and only God. And you remember uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And God sustained them with the peace they needed to display his mighty power to protect his people. King Nebuchadnezzar, as you remember, uh, had set up a golden image in the plain of Dura and commanded that all his officials bow down before this golden image. And all who failed to do so would be thrown into a blazing furnace. And certain officials had informed the king that these three Jewish youths were refusing to worship the golden statue. The three were brought before the king where they informed him that the from that king that God was still going to be with them, and he was. You recall Daniel was raised to a high office by his royal ma master, Darius the Mede. Daniel's jealous rivals tricked Darius into issuing a decree that for 30 days no prayers should be addressed to any god, little g, or man, but Darius himself. Any who break this are to be thrown to the lions, the decree said. But Daniel continued to do as he was supposed to do as a child of God, and he prayed to the one and only God of Israel. And the king, though deeply distressed, had to condemn Daniel to death because even kings must go by the king's decree. For the edicts of the Medes and Persians cannot be altered even by the king himself. So God sustained his child with peace again. And as God was able again to demonstrate his ability to protect his people. In all these stories we see that the world where Satan as we talked about last week is clearly by the Bible the ruler of the world. Well, Satan likes to mark the people of God as dirty, as worthy of complete destruction. But over and over, the people of God take that marking. The identification that was meant for a stigma, and they wear it as a badge of honor. And I want to stop and add, um, I love to research things, and so when I was researching 
the star that Magda would have worn uh, during the uh, during World War II in Nazi Germany. I'm sure by now all of you have seen one of these Jewish stars. And for the longest time, I assumed that that was just a star that had been created to identify the Jews in Nazi-occupied Germany. But it turns out that the marking of God's people by yellow, and in many cases by star, really extended even before that in certain places in Europe as well. And that not only had it been Jews, but also uh, the other people of the book, as uh, we were called, Christians also in some Muslim controlled areas also had to be marked. And so um, this week I just was, and of course, like I said, I think the Christians and the Jews had been marked similarly because they lumped them together as the people of the book. Uh, but I had made, I'll hold it up, you won't be able to see it that well, but I had made um, a cross mostly because I wanted to put it on that night that I made it because I made it in the same colors. Only it says, instead of saying Jude for Jew, it says believer. And I thought, and I wanted to put it on to say, what would I feel like or how would I react if the time ever came that Christians had to denote on themselves again and I felt instantly that pride and thought about how if I was out in a community and had been forced to wear a cross that said believer, how instead of being ashamed, even if that had been what the intent was to mark us, that it would be, I don't know about you all, but I would be incredibly uh, overjoyed that they recognized that I belong to Jesus Christ and would have instead, would instead wear such a marking with pride rather than with shame. In all these stories, we say again, we see that the Lord uh, will protect his people, but Satan will try to mark us to the nations and to the world as dirty. Even today, all of you know that many people sling the word Christian about as if those who are the followers of Christ need to be ashamed of ourselves. And those that do good in this world need to be ashamed of themselves. Those that follow the book, as again we are the uh, followers of the book, should be ashamed of ourselves. And I suspect eventually it's just going to become more and more difficult for those of us that call ourselves Christians. Well, I want to um, sort of end a little bit by telling you what a badge of honor is, if you don't really understand the phrase. A badge of honor doesn't mean somebody puts something on you and says, here, we're honoring you and marking you for honor, but instead it's something you've been marked with uh, as a negative. So to wear something instead as a badge of honor means that you are defiantly reinterpreting something that is said to be negative about you, and instead you are reinterpreting that to be something positive about you. So again, don't forget if anybody ever tries to shame you as being uh, a Christian and tries to use that as if it's a bad word, reinterpret it, continue to wear that badge, but as a badge of honor. My message to you today is this. No matter what happens in our world, always identify yourself as one of the people of God. And pray for and permit God to fill you with peace to endure whatever may come. Because our God is able to take care of his children. This world is not our home. The ruler of this world is not our ruler. You are a child of God, so wear that identification with pride. And ask your father for the peace to wear that badge of honor proudly. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we have always relied on those that are older than us, who have had more experience than us, to assure us that the times that we're in have happened before and give us advice for how they have gotten through. Lord, it is um, sometimes unnerving. I know that when I spoke to uh, my 90 some year old grandmother that just this week she said she'd never seen anything like what's going on now which means again we um, have again uh, learned that we don't rely on people we have to rely on you and you're clear over and over and over again that the nations have been rocked in the past the world has been rocked with unrest in the past and the things that we need to recall and remember always as Christians is continue to plow on through, 
trust our commander in chief, which is God, and to realize that we should let the world know we're Christians and be proud of that. And instead of being fearful, be filled with peace, that knowing that ultimately the Lord himself is in control. Lord, we thank you so much for giving us that peace and helping us to recall forever that we are part of a beautiful, strong family. We ask for your blessings as we go out into this week. Amen. And again, uh, my husband's going to play some music. I was very mindful about what music was going to be broadcast for the first time. So the first song, of course, was Bagpipes, Amazing Grace. The second one was uh, It Is Well With My Soul, again, because I feel like that's a beautiful message for the community. And I'm going to tell you from a selfish standpoint, one of my favorite songs is from The Color Purple. If you remember that scene where the world is coming into the church and they're singing,